20. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I'm going to read the whole chapter. John chapter 20. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter, therefore, went forth and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes laying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the sepulchre, that he must rise, or sorry, for as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulchre weeping, and, she, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and seeth two angels in white setting, the one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Women, why weepest thou? And she saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascended unto my Father, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. And the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciple therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. He, but he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach in hither thy finger, and behold mine hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, 
and she might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. He is risen, and today we celebrate that. These are often the, the sermons that I, I find are one of my favorites. They're often most, most polished by the preacher. I, I don't know that that's because of preparation that goes into it or, or, uh, or, or because it's just a special opportunity where God just gives power to his preachers to, to talk about the resurrection and, and to bring that to light. But I always like a good resurrection sermon that uh, there's more preparation to and, and, and they're, always, they're always so powerful. And, Lord, help me that, that today could be the same thing for us. I hear the first day of the week is, is mentioned in uh, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark, and she comes unto the sepulcher. And I, I, it's interesting. It just says over and over, the sepulcher, the sepulcher, the sepulcher. So much so that when I came to the word scriptures, I read the sepulcher. Because uh, he's just highlighting, I believe, the fact that, that there, there was this tomb. There was the, there's a tomb. There's a tomb. There's a tomb that he's no longer in, the sepulcher. They repeat that over and over. God doesn't repeat things just, just because he didn't. He didn't know what word to use there because he doesn't have, you know, some heavenly th thesaurus to kind of figure out a better word to go there. I think, I think God repeats things to, to drive a point home. He is risen, as he said. There was a sepulcher, but it's empty. Glory to God. Now, the breakdown of these events, you know, they call it Good Friday, but um, just a little bit of, of, of uh, what I have come to realize from studying this out. Now, if you look in uh, verse... 31 it talks of this being uh, no verse 31 it's something else where was that <clears throat> probably the previous chapter yeah uh, verse ni chapter 19 verse 31 it says the Jews therefore because it was the preparation that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day for that Sabbath day was in high day so this indicates that the day that Jesus was crucified and prepared unto his, his, his being sacrificed, essentially, aligning with the scriptures of God. It was an high day which made it a Sabbath day. It wasn't necessarily the seventh day. Jesus had to be in the grave for three days and three nights to fulfill the prophecy of Jonah. And so how he managed this was to find a way to have a Sabbath span to a high day, which gave opportunity for three Sabbaths in a row, therefore he could have those three days and three nights. And that's all an example of the fact that when Christ went to the grave, when Christ died on the cross and fulfilled the works of righteousness that are needed for us to have those imputed unto us, he made sure that it was on a Sabbath day so that no other work was being done. None of our works are part of Christ's sacrifice. And so Amen. all of the Jewish nation was on Sabbath while Jesus was doing all the works. <laughs> Amen for that. So what I have is that, is that you know, while he was laying in the grave, while he was paying our way, we were not doing any works at that time. So the Jewish calendar, I hear it all the time, but I think the scriptures give us a type of that when in Genesis 1 it says the evening and the morning were the first day. I don't really need a historian to know that the day starts with an evening and a morning. An evening and a morning. So it's a little bit different than, than how we do things, where we tend to start in the morning and go into the evening. Yet yeah, not even so, because we start at midnight, which is, is it the morning, is it the night? We don't really know. It's kind of this in-between. But basically, what I have is that there was a night which would be our Wednesday, which would be the Thursday night in the Jewish calendar. But let's just talk from our perspective. Wednesday night... The preparation day, Jesus dies on the cross and is put in the tomb right before sundown. The next day would be Thursday in the day. Then there would be Thursday night in our calendar, right? There would be Friday in the day and then Friday night. Then there would be Saturday in the day. And then what I believe was our night of Sunday, which would have been the evening of the Sunday, the first day of the week, that's when... That's when Christ rose from the dead, but he wasn't necessarily discovered until the morning. Actually, in that transition almost, because it talks about how Mary came when it was yet dark, in verse 1, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away. So somewhere between that event and the morning when the sun started to rise up was when Jesus rose from the dead. So what you have is Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. You have Thursday day 
Friday day and Saturday day, and there's your three days and three nights. Putting mm -hmm. Jesus in the tomb Wednesday evening and him rising from the dead the first day Sunday night. Okay, so it's good Wednesday if we were going to follow it, I believe, um, according to according to what we see here. And the reason why it was a Sabbath was because that all aligns with the Passover. And a lot of preachers today have 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 likened the Passover to the resurrection. And you can just you can just dig into these these studies and go back and forth and kind of find out how it all aligns. But but that's just that's just kind of a, a nutshell. It's not really going to be my my focus there. But that's how you get three days and three nights. And Good Friday is is nothing but a tradition, right? Because you can't get three days and three nights and have Christ rising. There's a little bit of dispute, and I think a lot of the confusion comes from the fact that the Jewish calendar kind of works a little bit different than ours. We don't have the same start of the day. And so that's why some people will say, well, it was a Thursday morning or it was a Wednesday night or it was a, a Thursday night. And they have different ways of accounting for that. But I believe Wednesday night was the day he was crucified. Now the stone then at that time was rolled away of the angel. And it's interesting here because she findeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher and, and they knew that it was very great. In another portion of scriptures it talks about the ladies coming down together to anoint the body of Jesus and they're talking among themselves who's going to remove this stone. So clearly this is something that three women couldn't manage themselves to remove. It was big enough. But glory to God they found it removed. Now I don't believe that they needed to find it. That I don't believe that it was removed so that the Lord could get out. But I, was, I believe it was removed so that we could peer in and see it empty. God, at this point, we find him later on in the passage with doors shut coming into the midst. He didn't need, he didn't need to rise from the dead. And then he's like, oh, man, I'm, I'm early. How do I get out of here? And need an angel to open the door for him. No, he, just, he would just walk through that. That's no big deal. The stone is open and rolled away so that we can behold the empty tomb. That was for us. That was for our benefit. Now, keep your finger there in John chapter 20. We'll be there. And you can go to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, if you will. And we're going to get a little bit of the, the two perspectives here. And that's the best way to study the Gospels, is to take all of them and kind of put a bookmark in each of them. And when the certain events happen that, that are mentioned in all four of them, just go from one to the other and read them back and forth and up and down, here a little, there a little, and, and you can get the full picture. In uh, Luke chapter 24... Beginning in verse 3, it says, Luke chapter 24, in verse 3, it says, And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, that was where the, in verse 1 of the, of the previous, in John 20, we saw that they arrived and found the stone removed away. Here they entered and found not the body of Jesus. Verse 4, And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? Okay, why are you seeking the living Christ among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his Words And this is the thing is that sometimes we hear the words of God but don't really remember them until we're experiencing that. And I don't know about yourself, but lately some scriptures have been really coming to life as, as these times have changed. And, you know, we're now in what the government's calling a new normal. Suddenly there's scriptures that I just rolled over that are suddenly coming to our remembrance. And that, that's exactly what they're experiencing here. The angel confesses that, hey... Don't you remember? He literally said he'd be delivered into sin, hands of sinful men. That he would be crucified. That he would rise from the dead. Remember, he said these things. And after it was brought to their remembrance, they were like, oh yes, we do remember these things. Back in John 20, in verse 2, it says, Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where... They have laid him. Luke 24 and verse 9, it says, And returned from the sepulchre and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. In verse uh, 11, it says, Their words seemed to them as idle tales. And they believed not. Back in John 20, you can find verse 3. It says, Peter went forth 
and that other disciple. And so while they dismiss them as idle tales, it seems that it's not something that Peter's willing to just, just balk at and leave alone. So Peter here in verse 3 went with the other disciple who we find is John. And it says, so they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. So John, it seems, was in a little bit better shape than Peter and he got down there quicker. But um, that was his strength, was his endurance and his ability to run. But it says in verse 5, And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went not in. So while he was bold and, and brave to get the running done, he didn't go first into the sepulcher, maybe for fear, maybe for just catching his breath. We don't know. But he doesn't go in yet. And yet here, in verse 6, it says, Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And so there's a good example here that while in these days sometimes we hear what we would perceive as an unbelievable fact or an unbelievable truth or something that is an idle tale, I don't think everything's worth just dismissing outright. We're hearing wars and rumors of wars. We're hearing all sorts of things coming to pass. We're hearing about, about this going on in that city and that going on in this city. And, and I think that we ought to be a little bit inquisitive about these things and, and seek them out, especially things that directly impact our circle. Here, these believers had known that Christ had died and was buried and placed in that tomb. And so when the women came... Who were, who were wonderful ladies, who were of the church, who had ministered to Jesus and with Jesus, who were reputable, though they dismissed what they said as idle tales. We see the example of Peter and John was that they weren't willing to just, to just re, re, kind of relinquish, throw it away and just not look into these. But rather, they went in to verify. And in days of fear and of deception, which was going on at this time as well, I believe, we need not to be afraid to go and to verify and to check some things out. An example comes to pass right here in, in verse 6 where it says, He comes and, and seeth where the linen clothes lie. And in verse 7, And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. And you know what? What specific Catholic doctrine and artifact that completely negates and destroys? Has anyone heard of the Shroud of Turin? This great big cloth that, that has the image of a long-haired, hippie, Jewish-looking man impressed in it. But the Catholics teach, actually, and, and, and many Protestants, that Jesus was wrapped in. And now they'll put it up in a museum, and they'll take pictures of it, and, and display it to the whole world as this was the cloth. And, and they're even finding, like, History Channel and stuff, doing tests of it. And they're like, we tested the DNA, and this DNA only had, like had one chromosome so it was only the blood of a father and not of a mother and they do all of these things we can verify these things by looking to the scriptures very clearly right here it just blows it apart because the shroud of turn is is one piece of cloth which is about six and a half feet tall and about four feet wide and, and it just shows you know this man that was crucified it, it, you know you see that you see a mark here you see a blood spot there and all of that is put on it but the scriptures clearly say here and we need to take heed to these types of things that we can debunk some things that have potential to be false in the last days you know what if they were to hypothetically use that shroud of turin as some sort of idol to bring more people into disbelief and unbelief wouldn't it be great if we had scriptures to contradict what's happening because we thought enough to not just look at something as an idle tale but to seek into it a little bit further well that's what this indicates it says in verse 7 and the napkin that was about his head not laying with the linen clothes but wrapped together in a place by itself jesus's linen cloths that he was in the tomb with were in pieces there was one for his head and there was one for his body see you later shroud of turin illegitimate right it's not verifiable, the scripture clearly says. Okay, so that's why in these times, I believe we need to, we need to have, have an eye that hears what could be very well an idle tale, but look into the scriptures to find the truth of these things. And here the example given by the disciples is they hear an idle tale and they go and verify for themselves. 
I believe that's a little bit of an aside there, but continue down in verse 8. And then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and saw and believed. So now we have two witnesses verifying what the women had said, that indeed Jesus is not there. His body is not present anymore. Verse 9 says, For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So you can keep your finger there in John chapter 20. Go back to John chapter 2. They had heard this before, and yet they did not believe. They knew not the scriptures. Isn't it amazing how we can hear something, even something from the Lord, and not know it, not, not have it in our remembrance, not, not practically have grasped that truth yet. And Jesus, way back in the beginning of his ministry, had told them before, and this is, this is another thing that I have kind of comes to my mind is the things that Jesus told you way back in the early years of your Christianity, those are important. I, I believe Jesus set the groundwork of your whole life there. So here's an example. I learned early on in my Christianity that I got to be in church. And here I am years later practically acting that out. I got to be in church no matter what anybody says because God told me that and here today I know that thing to be true and yet sometimes of course there's things that God's told me over the years that I'm going to forget until I read them again until they're brought to my remembrance John 2 and verse 15 it says and when he had made a scourge of small courts he drove them out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine health hath eaten me up. So they remembered that the father's house was to be a house of prayer unto all nations. And they applied that Psalm 69 and 119 to the event where it said, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. You know, the, the, the zeal of his house that was not for something right is eating him up. It's bothering him, the zeal of God's own house. And so he does this thing. Then he's challenged, though, and he begins to say something that they're not going to catch. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. See, they had just seen a practical application of a truth from the scriptures. And now they're wondering, as he answers them with destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise up how that applies to that physical temple. And that's why they're going to respond to this way, in a carnal way. Verse 20, then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building, and thou wilt rear it up in three days. Verse 21, but he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. So here back in John 2, he's giving a truth that, yeah, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. But he's speaking specifically of the temple of his body. And it took all the way back, three years almost later in his ministry, for them to get what he meant. John, therefore, in you know, hindsight being 2020, drops that truth in there in John chapter 2 saying, hey, we didn't get this until way at the end. And we see John doing that a lot, which is, which is what makes this book of John really easy to read for new believers. Because he'll give you examples of like, and this was Judas really early on, which betrayed him. And he'll tell you the end of the story so that you're following along. And yeah, it's suspenseful and it's exciting, but, but you already know the characters. You already know some events. And he, he makes these things clear for us as we walk through them. Acts chapter 2 then, in verse 24, also talks about this. Acts chapter 2, in verse 24, it says, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption, thou hast made known to me the ways of life, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. And so here, referring back to Psalm chapter 16 in his sermon, Peter's giving the, the fullness of what he has come to realize, though in the moment 
he didn't he didn't realize it so when it was playing out when Jesus had left the sepulcher and the women reported he verified yes he's not there but they still didn't grasp what was taught them 18 chapters earlier and he still didn't completely grasp it in this moment but we see that it did come to pass that he understood it enough to put it into a sermon back in John chapter 20 we find in verse 10, it says, Then the disciples went away unto their own house, unto their own home. So here we get an example of them seeing it and then just going back into their own, their own homes and I believe just probably dwelling on these things and thinking about these things and searching the scriptures to find these things out. And now the Bible gives us an, an, an aside of Mary Magdalene. And this story is great. Verse 11, it continues and says, And Mary stood, now that she's alone, without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white, the one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have lain him. Now, can anyone truly take away our Lord? I mean, if he is the Son of God, if he's the King of Kings, if he was God incarnate, he can't be taken away. For a moment, it, it seems that she, she's, she's lost him, but as it's clearly proclaimed in the other gospel that we read in Luke, she's seeking for the living God among the dead. She's lost her focus in that, in that Christ promised he would raise, and she has access to the living God, and yet she's looking for the dead God. She's looking for the dead man. She's looking for the dead religion. And this is the thing that we can get bogged into in times of stress and turmoil and struggle, is that, is that instead of seeking after the living, we get stuck in the dead. We get stuck in this world. We get stuck in our religious ruts, the ways of man, the ways of this world, we're seeking who's living among the dead when we need to just seek after the living. Who's among the living? Can anyone take away our Lord, though it feels that way sometimes? And though they want to try to take away our access to meeting together and being with the Lord's people and being assembled together and having, having that available to us, they can't take away our Lord. Even if they were to quarantine us and, and force us to be in different places, they can never take away our Lord. Verse 14, though it feels like it sometimes, of course. Verse 14, it says, And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Now, I don't know if he was in a different form at this time or whether his, his, his resurrected body just looked so different or whether he was dressed differently. I don't know, but she knew him not at this time. And Jesus in verse 15 says, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Woman, who are you seeking for? She says, Tell me where he is. Completely ignoring the question. She's distraught. She's concerned here. She, she, she knew him not no, the Lord was standing right before her. And I love this. He saith, Mary. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. And that, that song that I shared, you know, he knows my name. Every step that I take, every move that I make, every tear that I cry. When I'm overwhelmed by the pain, when I can't see the light of day, I know I'll be just fine because he knows my name. And Mary had that experience. And, and that was what prompted her to be like, Lord, it's him. it's him. It's the Lord. She saw him. She looked on him. She, she was engaging in conversation with him at that time. And yet until he said, Mary. And finally she realized her name. Her name was, came across his lips. He knows my name. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say master. When he showed that he knew her name, she realized that she knew him and who he was. 
And that's a great truth of our God, is that He does know our name. He knows our frame. He knows each one of us personally. And so we don't have to worry when we think that we can't find Him. He knows your name. He knows where you are. He knows the very numbers of hairs upon your head. He cares for you. He, he, he holds you in a special and unique place in the palms of His hands, the Bible says. He knows your name, and, and Mary comes to this realization that it's the Lord that's standing before her when he states it. Verse 16, part B, it says there, She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is, which is to say, Master, and now overwhelmed with relief, she begins to jump at him, throw herself at him, even as I believe she had done before when she washed his feet with her tears falling at his feet, anointing him with oil. She comes at him as she had always did and expected to have that same experience with her risen York. What a relief. Not only have we found your body, we found you alive. We found you well. We found you here, Lord. You've, you're, you're alive. You've risen from the dead. And she, she comes at him, and Jesus quickly saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended unto my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. At this time we find in verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. So Mary Magdalene here witnesses twice to the disciples in different fashion. First she came and said, we don't know where his body is. And secondly, by the command of the Lord, he says, don't touch me, I have work to do. I believe he took the, the blood and, and put it upon the mercy seat in heaven to fulfill all righteousness at that time and to basically grant the way into heaven because, because once the blood was placed upon the mercy seat, sin was atoned for, sin was covered, sin was finished to those that would believe it. And he says, I'm going to my father and your father, I'm going to my God and your God to fulfill this thing. You go and tell the disciples and the Mary that came in distress and crying and, and mourning and weeping, saying, we don't know where they have laid his body, is now saying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And she's, she's proclaiming to the disciples that truth, that she had seen him. She had spoken with him. He knows my name. He called me by name. If you continue on in Mark chapter, you can keep your finger there in, in John. And go to Mark chapter 16 mark chapter 16 in mark 16 and verse 9 it says now when jesus was risen early the first day of the week he appeared first to mary magdalene out of whom he had cast seven devils and here this woman that had seven devils cast out of her i mean somebody that could get so possessed by demons you got to wonder the life that she had lived, that she had been forgiven of. Now she's given this special opportunity to see the Savior first of all and comfort others who are yet to behold him. Verse 10, And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. So if we go back in verse 19 in John chapter 20, it says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. So here, Mary returns. She's given this opportunity in all of her sins, in all of her, her, her things that she had been forgiven. The one that loved much because she was forgiven much, sees the risen Savior, brings that report back to the disciples, and, and they don't want to hear it. They're, they're busy mourning. They're busy weeping. They're busy in torments over what had happened to their Lord. Here she brings them the, the truth brings them encouragement, yet they receive it not. And so, when in verse 19 we find them meeting together, again, the first day of the week, we find that the doors are shut. The disciples here are assembled for fear of the Jews. They lost sight of the risen Savior, and therefore fear had overcome them, to the point where they're just going to shut up their meeting. Special invite only. Nobody's going to join in this meeting. We're locking the doors. To the upper room where we're assembled together. Church is closed. 
for fear of the Jews, for fear of the, the religious leaders, for fear of those that, that, that are seeking after their lives and after their liberties. The Jews often were, were after them just hating the liberty that they had in Christ. That was one of the most hated things that the Jews had because their religion was so structured. It was bondage. They put bondage on people. And so the liberty that Christians have was what made them the most angry. So here, they're trying to destroy those that are following after the Savior, even as they had thought they had destroyed the Savior. And here, with the doors shut, and they're all assembled for fear, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace, be still. Now here, there's an evening meeting. It's a, it's a Sunday. The doors shut in this assembly. And there, Jesus came into the midst. Were they afraid at first? I think so. I think when the doors were locked and then and then instead of hearing somebody come up the hall, the, the doors were shut and then instead of instead of hearing somebody approach from outside, suddenly the Lord is in the room and he just says, Peace, be still. They were probably their probably hearts leapt up into their throats. They're just, what in the world? And so he says, Peace be still, and yet great fear likely fell upon them. It says in verse 20, and when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. It's amazing that Mary saw the Lord, didn't recognize him, still had the fear of losing her Savior until he spoke, and then great comfort came unto her. Then she went and she proclaimed that he was risen, he was alive. I spoke with him. The disciples believed not and heard the voice of God, and that terrified them. And so when he had said these things, it took them seeing the Lord that suddenly they're glad. Suddenly they're calm when they see the Lord, the Savior. It's a little bit of a, a, a difference of, 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 of how people receive the truth. Some of us have to see things to believe. Some of us have to hear things to believe continues on and, and it shows in, in, in verse 20 that they finally were glad when they had seen the Savior. Verse 21 it says, Then said Jesus unto them again, Peace be unto you. So now he's going to talk again. He's going to speak unto their hearts and say, As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Now you can turn to uh, Luke chapter 4. Keep your finger there, John. Turn to Luke chapter 4. And as you're turning to Luke chapter 4, let me read for you John, 1 John chapter 4, and verse 14. It says, We have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So when Jesus says, So send I you, even as the Father hath sent me, is he saying that he's sending us to be the saviors of the world? Look over there in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Look at the breakdown of that sentence. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. He hath endued him with power. He hath given him the responsibility to. As the Father hath sent the Son, so sends he us. He sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He hath sent us, I believe, to do the same thing. He sent the Son with the Spirit of the Lord upon him, anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor, so sends he you in the Spirit of in the power of the Spirit, anointing you to preach the gospel to the poor. Look at that. There's a semicolon there. Meaning what happens after is grouped with what was just said. It's not a continuing list. He sent you to preach the gospel to the poor. That's the bottom line. That's, that's the single responsibility there. And that couples very nicely with sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. How are we going to save the world? By preaching the gospel to the poor. We're going to see the world saved by the preaching of the gospel. A part of that is, is this, and this is all encompassing. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And that, isn't that what we do when we preach the gospel to the poor? To preach deliverance to the captives, those that are, those that are captive of their own wicked works. Those are captives of their own sins. Those are even captive and locked up in cages for the, for the, the sins of their past. 
We're to preach deliverance unto the poor. We're to preach the gospel to the poor. The recovering of sight to the blind. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And when the gospel is preached, the blind see. Amen. He says, set at liberty them that are bruised. Those that are tender. Those that are pained. Those that have been hurt this life and in this world setting them at liberty how by preaching the gospel to them where the spirit of lord of the lord is there is liberty the bible records and to preach the acceptable year of the lord is all part of the gospel the good news is that he has risen and even so shall you do you want to save the world well as he sends you as he was sent we're sent the same way. We are anointed. We are endued with power to preach the gospel, to heal broken hearts, to preach deliverance to the captives, give sight to the blind, set at liberty those that are bruised, preach the acceptable year of the Lord when he shall return, when he shall come, when he shall set all things as they ought to be in his plans and in his, in his goals and in his perfect will. Back in John chapter 20, verse 22. Jesus says, Peace be still unto you, in verse 21. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. The Spirit anointed Jesus to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent Jesus to be the Savior of the world. He says, So send I you. Verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on him, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. If you were to go back in John a few chapters, there's a whole bunch of time that is broken up. You know, the, the kind of dialogue of things, um, as far as the story unfolds, goes from, I think, John chapter 12 into 13, and then there's just this big, long sermon. And in this big, long sermon, Jesus talks about how I need to go so that I can send the Spirit unto you, so that I can give the Spirit unto you. If I don't leave, the Comforter will not come. And here is that promise fulfilled in receiving the Holy Ghost. He says, hey, as I have come in the power and anointing of the Spirit of God, so send I you. As the Father hath sent me with the Holy Ghost, so send I you with the Holy Ghost. He breathes that Spirit into his believers. And when he does, he says this, verse 23, whosoever sins he remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins he retain, they are retained unto you. He gives them power over sin. Isn't that wonderful? He gives them power over sin. How do you remit sins to somebody? You're preaching the gospel. They get saved. Their sins are remitted. Amen. They're removed as far as the east is from the west. How do you have their sins retained unto them? You withhold preaching. You don't save the world. You don't, you don't seek and save that which is lost. You don't fulfill the responsibility that as the Father sent Jesus, so send I you. Their sins are retained of you, and they are retained when you don't. And so the power of life is in our hands. We have the power to go and seek and save that which is lost and give sight to the blind and preach deliverance to the captives, heal broken hearts and do all of these great things, but we must go in order to do and fulfill this responsibility of ours. I believe there's an overarching truth there that talks about the, uh, the, the church's responsibility to have judgment over sins and how to, how to you know, put in um, discipline if it's needed within the house of God. But ultimately here in the context, he's basically just saying, hey, you have control. You are powerful over sins. You can remit them by preaching the gospel and get people saved. Or you can retain them by not, by yielding from your responsibilities. If you continue on in verse 24, the Bible says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Now here's an encouragement to be in the assembly. Here's an encouragement to be with the church when they're assembled in the upper room, even though the doors are locked. Here's an encouragement to be in the house of God. I heard it so many times. I don't know how many times. It's, it's very few, but, but there have been a few times where I missed a church service and come in and say, how is church? And they're just like, uh, you know, I, I, I can't even, I, I can't even understand. I can't even begin to explain to what happened. We, we were all hiding and Jesus came into the midst. We we're all fearful and Jesus came into the midst. And here in verse 25, 
we, we find out previous that Thomas wasn't there when they had all had this experience in the congregation and in the assembly. It says, The other disciples therefore said unto him, unto Thomas, We have seen the Lord! <laughs> but he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger to the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And so that these disciples saw a great and wondrous work where the Lord had shown up into their meeting. He had come to the house of God. Great things happened that day in church. And he missed it. And they were at a loss of how to explain to him what had happened. I've been on the other side of these things. It was just an awesome move in the house of God. And, and, and people, are, people are getting things right. There's, there's testimonies happening. God's really moving in his service. And then somebody comes in like Thomas and is like, so oh, what happened in church? And you can't explain it. So he says, well, unless I see it, unless I experience I don't even believe it. I don't want to even believe what you guys went through while you were meeting together today. Great experience and revelations are often hard to explain. And, and the thing is, is that, is, that, is that what you miss from not assembling can be real. You can miss that sermon. That, that straightens you out. You can miss that song that touches your heart. You can miss that portion of scriptures that, that changes your life. You can, you can miss healing. You can miss, you can miss greater things than even what I'm listing. And here, the disciple Thomas went without the Holy Ghost, the gift that was given for eight days. Verse 26, and after eight days again, the disciples were within, and Thomas with them. You imagine everybody gets this great gift of the Spirit abiding in them. I mean, I love having the Spirit of God abiding in me. I love the fact that Scripture has come to my mind. I love the fact that I open this book up and it speaks to me like it will never speak to an unbeliever. They look at you cross-eyed and say, look at the significance of that word sepulcher. Isn't that amazing? And you, you pull these Scriptures out and God tugs at your heart through the Holy Ghost working in you. And for, for eight days, all of these disciples who had been assembled together had the experience of the Holy Ghost working in their hearts. And Thomas was probably just like, what is this? Some new thing? You think of the confusion that came over at Pentecost when the Spirit was not in them but upon them and everyone was like, these men are drunken. I don't know what Thomas would have thought but for eight days he missed out because he wasn't in the house of God. And he had unbelief because of it. He could not be faithful. He could not believe the words that were being told to him, though they came from witnesses that he had loved and he had trusted. And so for eight days, he had to wait. But our Lord's good. He was gracious to uh, come and to repeat it again. Then came Jesus in verse 26. The doors being shut. I mean, the, the spirit living in you didn't take away their fears entirely. But then again, it's, it's probably just some wisdom here that we're learning that there's nothing wrong with an invite-only church service. The door's being shut and nobody else is coming in. We see in uh, Acts there, they all get together, the doors are shut and locked, and they're all praying for Peter. And even Peter isn't invited when he shows up. They think he's a ghost and they keep, keep the door locked. They're not going to even let, let Peter into his own prayer meeting. So there's nothing wrong here with having a closed church service, the doors being shut. He stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. The disciples were probably like, yeah, here it is, Thomas. Here's what we said. But he says, then he then saith he to Thomas, and I love that because the Lord basically is saying here, he's like, he's like, you missed for eight days, but but here is what you missed. And he brings him back to that spot. And you know what? That that's the faithfulness and love of our God. That when we do miss an opportunity to make a decision or we miss an opportunity to get a blessing, God doesn't just close those doors down. He's gracious enough to just give us a little time to walk around the wilderness and right and right back up at where we need to make that same decision and, and do the right thing this time. So God was faithful enough to reenact this thing for Thomas. He says, reach in, hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. He, he gives him that other opportunity to have the exact same experience that the others had. And he says, Thomas, be not faithless, but believing. This is what you missed. And I know what you missed and out in the experience, but let me repeat it for you again. And he, he's gracious to Thomas in that time. 
He didn't beat up on him. He didn't say, what weren't you doing in church? And, you know, just, just, just be hard on him. He just rather, one week later, plus a day, came back and, and joined them and gave him that same opportunity. And Thomas is humbled by it, verse 28. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And there's an example of Jesus being, being proclaimed in the scriptures as being God, as being the Lord, and uh, receiving that worship. You can use that if people don't believe that the Lord is God. Jesus, in verse 29, saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are all, essentially, those from henceforth. I mean, there's not many more days here that Jesus is going to be with them, eating fish with them, showing them himself openly, letting them touch him and handle him, and, 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 and having close and intimate fellowship. with The time has come where the people that have seen and believed are, 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 are going to be few and far between, and eventually that, that's not how you'll be able to enter in. You'll have to only enter in by faith. And blessed are those that have not seen and yes believe. Blessed are those that from henceforth, though they be stubborn, though they be unbelieving, and though they be trying to just get some sort of proof as to God's existence and never receive that, yet the word of God entering in opens their eyes. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And blessed are those that that hear the word of God and believe it. Blessed are those that, that as, as Mary was, was not able to see the Lord and yet heard her name, heard the words of his mouth, and then his voice proclaiming her name was what reminded her that it was the Savior. Blessed are those that will hear through our words and our testimony the word of God and will come to believe. Blessed are those. And Christian here today, you want more faith? Get out of the news. You want to grow in the things of God? Stop, stop reading books about the Bible. Stop studying other things. Stop looking at the news. Stop watching YouTube videos. Stop playing video games. Stop doing everything. You want more faith? You want more strength? You want more encouragement? You want to walk the walk and talk the talk? You want, you want the Savior to be yoked up with you? Just get in the Word. We need more faith in these days, and that's how we get it. He said to Thomas, he's like, be not faithless. Believe. Be not faithless. Believe. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God, Christians. Get in that Bible. Verse 31 says, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written. And so, as if resurrection wasn't enough. As if, as if coming into a room that was closed and locked and barred, entering into that meeting. As, as if... As if walking on water, as if healing the lame, as if, you know, speaking and flu bugs disappear, you know, viruses, they, they flee away. As, as, if, as if all these great miracles weren't enough, the Bible here says many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. And I think that's talking about the context of this immediate time where, where the disciples were experiencing their time with the risen Savior. I don't know if they challenged him and said, Lord, how did you walk through this room? And he said, uh, we'll look at some other things that I can do. This is what the resurrected body will look like. This is what you will experience one day. I don't know what that was like, but the Bible says there's many other signs. When we get to heaven, let's ask them. What were these many other signs that you did? I know that they weren't written in this book because your book had a purpose, which you said in verse 31. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. I understand that you have wrote what you wrote to the end that people might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and have life through his name. But Lord, tell us the other signs. Tell us of the other miracles. Show us the great things that were done which were not written in this book. One day we can have that, but this is providing another glimpse of the sufficiency of the scriptures that we have. Jesus did many other things, but these are written that you might believe. This is sufficient to fulfill your belief, to fulfill your faith. Look, we don't need to drive our fingers into the prints of his hand or into the mark in his side to believe. He says, blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. Why? Because we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereby ye do well to take heed, and that's the word of God. These are written, and they are sufficient that ye may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and believing you might have life through his name. We have what we need. It's sufficient, everything that he has provided. 
And that is another testimony not only to his scriptures, but also to his sacrifice. Jesus has fulfilled all righteousness. Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient. Jesus is all we need. And what he did upon the cross and what he did in the heart of the earth and what he did when he rose from the dead and what he did in heaven just before he let Mary and the disciples actually embrace him. Those things that he did are sufficient for us. We don't need any more. Jesus Christ plus nothing and minus nothing. All we need is Christ and he is the word of God. And that's how this gospel begins. In the beginning was the word. The word is with God. The word was with God and the word was God. And that's all we need. It says over in chapter 21 and verse 25, it says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Our Lord did so, 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 so much for us, and yet he's given us exactly what we need contained in 66 books, 1,189 chapters, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of words of God that we have available to us. The only reason that I believe the resurrection is because the word of God gave me faith to do it. The only reason I believe in the death and the burial is because the word of God gave me the faith to do it. Don't be a Christian, especially in these days, that needs proof of everything. Our proof is faith. Let's trust God, let's believe God, and let's look to Him at times like this for the certainty, the sufficiency that is in Christ. Amen. I think God